The secret Santa gift exchange in my family has always been a cursed tradition. Love it or hate it, it's part of our holidays. We have a large family, around 30 people all together, and we play a version of the game where you can steal each other's presents. Things have gotten heated in the past, even downright nasty at times, but this year, it's really gotten out of hand. Let me start from the beginning. We were all gathered around the Christmas tree at my cousin Jessica's house. It was Christmas Eve. A turkey dinner had been consumed and desserts were now arranged on the dining room table. The desserts looked delicious, but were untouched. We were all too nervous about what was going to happen next. A few people were drinking coffee or beer, while others had wine glasses in their hands and were swirling them thoughtfully, releasing tannins and building tension. There was a strange feeling in the room. Animosity and a lurking hatred was underlying the entire event. It was a symphony of cynicism building to a crescendo of contempt. I wasn't sure what was about to happen, but it seemed like it was going to be bad. It felt like a fuse was burning, a sizzling wick inching closer and closer to a stick of dynamite that was ready to blow. Time for Secret Santa, my cousin Jessica announced, entering the room with the stocking in her hands, full of numbers written on little pieces of paper. Remember, you can only pick a present if you brought a present with you. Anybody who skimped out on gifts doesn't get to play. I'm looking at you, Noel. My brother looked down at his shoes and muttered something incomprehensible. He had tried to pull the same thing last year, hoping to get a free present without bothering to buy one. Classic Noel. Jessica went around the room with the stocking and everyone stuck their hand inside to remove a number. Everyone except for Noel. He sat back and watched everything with a sour look on his face, drinking a beer. I watched as everyone pulled their numbers from the stocking and as I did, I thought about all the horrible things they'd done. I couldn't help it. My family was a bunch of pricks. My aunt Debbie removed a number and smiled with her annoying grin, then slurped some wine from her glass, smacking her lips and loudly saying, ah, as she always did. Aunt Debbie had put my grandmother into a nursing home, stolen her house, and we were pretty sure she was spending all of her money. But we had no way of proving it, since she'd gotten my grandma to sign a power of attorney form before she was officially diagnosed with dementia. In other words, Aunt Debbie was not a very nice person. My Uncle Dave took out a number, then chugged his beer, belching loudly afterwards. Dave's sins were numerous and awful, including defrauding people and the government for disability. But that wasn't even the tip of the iceberg. He was a drunk womanizer, an addicted gambler, and he had been arrested several times for driving under the influence. And those are just the things I can talk about publicly. My cousin Randy had been in and out of jail since he turned 16, mostly for beating people up at clubs and bars. He plucked a number out of the stocking, his five bulky gold rings reflecting the Christmas tree lights. He had once told me he wore all those rings because brass knuckles were illegal but there was no law against wearing a bunch of rings and knocking someone's teeth out with those. I could go on and on, but the point is that everyone sitting around that Christmas tree was awful, and they all hated each other, and me, for various reasons. There was more than enough motive for a dozen murders. We began to exchange Christmas gifts and things got heated immediately. My cousin Chester had picked the number one from the stocking, meaning he got to go first. He opened a wrapped present containing a Henkel knife set, which he said was exactly what he wanted. He clutched the box to his chest protectively, his eyes darting around the room at the potential thieves who surrounded him. His sister, my cousin Jessica, stole the knife set two rounds later when it was her turn. It was part of the game, but still, Chester looked angry afterwards, especially when he opened the next gift to replace it. It was a Nora Roberts book that looked like it had been gently used. Not quite as nice as the knife set. Who the fuck brought this? Chester asked, shaking with rage. It was supposed to be a $50 value. Nobody would admit to the crime, 
and so the game continued. Chester was red in the face and looked ready to murder someone, but he didn't say another word. I tried to look around the room and see if anyone was showing any emotion on their face, but they were all maintaining blank expressions. No one would admit they'd brought the used book, probably taking it from a dusty bookshelf at home so they could save $50. As the game continued, there were more baffling presents. Some were of the proper value, but there were a few that were way cheaper than usual, like an ice pick and a hammer and a rusty old saw but nobody would admit they had brought them. I saw a few suspicious glares cast around the room, but the game continued on. Finally, it ended, and the tension could be cut with a knife or a rusty saw blade. Everyone was glaring at everyone else, looking angry for various reasons. Some were so enraged they were shaking. Some had their faces turning red, Others gripped beer bottles and wine stems so tightly they looked ready to shatter. Chester rose to his feet and dropped the Nora Roberts book to the floor, raising his hand to point at Jessica. He was trembling with rage, his face red from too much anger and alcohol. He opened his mouth. Give me back my knife set, you bitch. But then the lights went out and all hell broke loose. I heard a glass shatter, a woman screamed, Light bulbs broke, tree ornaments were crushed underfoot, and there was a loud noise like scuffling and fighting all around me. Several more people were screaming, telling their attackers to stop, but they didn't relent. One person managed to turn on their cell phone's flashlight function, only to have the device slapped out of their hand a second later, casting the room in darkness again. In that brief flash of light, I saw so much blood. I could hear what sounded like someone's head being slammed into the ground over and over again, and that set me running. I caught a glimpse of something strange which took me several minutes to register. At that moment, I just thought it was someone wearing a pair of round glasses, but later I would come to realize those were night vision goggles. At least one person had come prepared for this. They had known that the lights would go out and when it would happen. Another scream could be heard, this time from a man, and I tried desperately to get out of the room, stumbling over people and furniture. I banged my knee hard against something, which I at first mistook for a couch, but then realized was the back of someone's head. They fell to the floor, and I accidentally stepped on their hand, feeling their bones crunch beneath my feet as I tried to escape. Ow! What the fuck? My Uncle Dave yelled. Whoops, sorry. I called over my shoulder, diving into the entry hall. I landed in a pile of shoes and realized I was right beside the front door. I could easily get out and escape, then call the police. I tried the door handle and realized it was locked. Not only that, someone had removed the key which served to lock it from the inside. It had been installed where my grandma with dementia lived here to keep her safe since she had run off once and nearly gotten killed. The problem was without that key, there was no way to get the door open. Suddenly, I heard a gunshot and ducked down, crawling away on all fours to try to get to cover. The basement was the safest bet, I realized. From there, I could try the back door. Either that, or I could try to crawl out a window. As I raced down the stairs, I heard people screaming and howling in pain as they attacked one another. I had always joked that my family would kill each other over the holidays, but I never really thought it would happen. It turned out I didn't know them as well as I thought I did. When I got down to the basement, I checked the back door and found it was locked as well, with the same missing key predicament as the front door. Someone had planned all of this out, but who? I crossed the room to try the windows next, my mind racing as I tried to decide who was capable of all this. Chester? Aunt Debbie? Cousin Randy or Uncle Dave? The windows were locked too. And not only that, they looked to be nailed shut with strange candy cane colored nails. Actually, on closer inspection, they were candy canes, sharpened to a point and driven into the wood of the window panes haphazardly and at odd angles, as if done quickly and in a rage. This was all getting too strange. It felt like I was in a dream, a nightmare, and all I needed to do was pinch myself and I would wake up. Ow! Okay, that didn't work. From above me, I heard the sounds of fighting dying down, 
and bodies collapsing to the floor, as if people were dropping dead one after another. My family was in the process of killing each other, I realized, and here I was, hiding in the basement like a coward. The longer I stood down there, cowering in fear, the more I tried to build up my courage to intervene. I needed to do something. I needed to stop all this. Christmas was supposed to be a time for families to get together and show how much they cared about each other. They weren't supposed to be murdering each other. Somehow, I had to stop them, to remind them that they really cared about each other, at least the ones who were still alive. I crept up the stairs quietly, sticking to the outside of the steps to avoid making creaking sounds. My cell phone was in my hand and I turned on the flashlight function, hearing a sound from the kitchen to my right. It was a gurgling, choking sound. I looked to see my cousin Jessica had been hung from the fridge like a stocking above the fireplace on Christmas morning. She was hanging in place, her arms, legs, and torso secured with knives that had been driven through her and into the fridge door. Blood poured from her mouth and eyes as she tried to call for help unsuccessfully. Chester, I muttered, realizing it had to have been him. He had done this to her as revenge for stealing her knife set. Then I heard his voice from behind me. You brought that Nora Roberts book, didn't you? He shouted, charging at me from the darkness. You cheap piece of shit! Chester had a small knife clutched in his hand, and he swiped at me with it, cutting my arm which held the phone. I dropped my only light source, but it landed with the blinding light facing up towards the ceiling, casting the kitchen in bright white light. It wasn't me! I brought that gift basket full of jams and jellies! I yelled, searching for a weapon. I found one behind me, driven into the fridge door. I tore the chef knife from Jessica's abdomen, and she howled in pain. Fuck! She screamed, her body weight shifting and putting way too much pressure on a knife which was jammed through her wrist. Sorry, I said, meaning it. I really needed this though. Chester pounced toward me with the small knife in his hand, slashing the air in front of me, trying not to get too close. I kicked outward with my foot, catching him in the gut and sending him reeling backwards, falling to the floor. I don't want to hurt you, Chester. It's fucking Christmas, dude. Come on. What are we doing here? But Chester didn't respond. He was slow to move on the floor, and I realized he had hurt himself somehow. Uh, uh. He moaned, rolling over onto his back. The small knife which he had clutched in his hand a moment before was now dug into his chest. Oh shit, man. I'm so sorry, Chester. I didn't mean to. Oh, fuck. What did I do? I picked up my phone from the ground and looked at my cousin for a few moments. I couldn't help feeling remorse as he breathed in his last breath. I moved on to the dining room. I could still hear the sounds of a scuffle happening from out there, but it was faint, as if there weren't many people left alive. No! Ah! Stop! A voice said. Then a bubbling gurgle turned into silence. Someone was escaping into the shadows, and I caught a glimpse of a tacky Christmas sweater before they disappeared around a corner. Aunt Debbie. I looked down to see the dead body of my Aunt Becky with an ice pick protruding from one of her eyeballs, which had been driven down into her skull. Another commotion ensued a second later as someone met Aunt Debbie in the living room. Someone had been waiting for her there, and she fell to the ground hard. A familiar voice began to laugh and a noise like a tree being cut down could be heard from the darkness. Uncle Dave's laughter grew louder and louder, and I realized it was him. He was sawing off Aunt Debbie's head with a rusty hacksaw, the same one he'd received as a present from beneath the tree. You bitch! Try to give me a crappy present again this year? I know you got all that money squirreled away, buried in your hidey holes, and you give me this? Where'd you find it? Buried in Ma's garage? Blood erupted like a fountain from her neck. But then a second later, there was a loud bang, and Dave fell off of her. Someone had shot him, I realized. I cast my phone around in every possible direction, the beam of light showing the carnage which had become our family Christmas gathering. Aunts, uncles, cousins, everyone I knew was surrounded by a pool of coagulated blood, their faces frozen in looks of sheer terror and hatred. They were all dead, everyone except for one. My brother Noel emerged from the shadows, clapping his hands together slowly and thoughtfully, the pistol tucked beneath his arm. Noel? I asked, dumbstruck. 
It was you? <laughs> he just chuckled at that. I guess you finally managed to figure it out. But... But why? They were our family. How could you do this to them? He looked around at the dead body strewn across the floor. Then he shrugged. You call this a family? We all hated each other. Everyone wanted to kill each other. All I did was give them an opportunity. I don't get it. So what if we hated each other a little bit? Every family is like that. Every family is dysfunctional and weird and they get mad at each other for stuff. But it's not supposed to matter. We were a family. I guess you're just a bit more sentimental than me, little bro. But hey, look on the bright side. Now the two of us can keep all the presents, everything. The knife set, the gift basket, those wood puzzles, and that sweet Nora Roberts book. It's all ours. He came towards me, his evil, twisted grin showing in the harsh white light of my phone. He looked like a monster. He was a monster. No, I'll never join you. You're insane. You did all this just for Christmas presents? You brought night vision goggles to kill your family in the dark when you could have just put that money towards a secret Santa item and prevented all of this. Noel looked confused at that. Night vision goggles? I didn't buy any night vision goggles. What the hell are you? He stopped speaking mid-sentence, letting out a strangled sound. What, Noel, are you all right? That was when I saw the sharpened end of a candy cane protruding from his chest. Noel fell to the ground, face down, and the curled end of the candy cane could be seen jutting out from his back, stained red with blood near the entry wound. <laughs> a squeaky voice laughed from the darkness. Who the hell is that? I asked, feeling more scared than I'd been all night. Whoever it was didn't sound like a member of my family. Their laughter sounded strange and high-pitched. Little footsteps skittered away, moving towards the stairs which led to the basement. I caught another glimpse of night vision goggles, the red tinted lenses reflecting in the darkness. For some reason, I followed them. I needed to know who it was. I needed to know what the hell was going on. I crept back down the basement stairs, deeper into the darkened space. My flashlight beam began to flicker and die suddenly, as if it were a cheap old AA battery powered beam. What the hell? I muttered, slapping the side of the device. As I stepped foot down in the basement, the light went out completely and I was left standing in the darkness. The door at the top of the stair slammed shut, loud and sudden, with a noise that made me jump. Ah! Who's down here? I called out, still holding the chef knife in my hand, which I had forgotten was there. You better answer me. I'm not messing around. A high-pitched squeak of laughter erupted from the center of the room, and then it could be heard on the other end of the room. A similar giggle could be heard from a few feet away, behind the couch. Suddenly, there were dozens of little voices, all laughing merrily from around me in the darkness. Eyes began to emerge from behind hiding places, and I could see they were all tinted red glass, belonging to the goggles of night vision masks. I was so scared, my legs were shaking as I clutched the knife tightly and spun in a circle, trying not to let them sneak up on me. I was getting dizzy turning around so fast, but everywhere I looked, there were more of them. Their little grins too small to belong to adults and too grown up to belong to children. These were, no, it couldn't be. It wasn't possible. Elves? Above me, there was a sudden noise on the roof. More than one noise, actually. It sounded like 32 hooves dancing on the snow-capped roof of the house. And then a loud pair of boots began to trudge across the icy tiles toward the chimney. The fireplace was just a few feet away, I realized, as I heard someone sliding down the length of it, getting closer and closer by the second. A fat man in a bright red suit emerged from the fireplace. His jacket and pants were lined with white fur and a red hat with a white puff on the end sat atop his head. His cheeks were rosy, as was his nose, and beneath his happy grin was the biggest, whitest beard I'd ever seen. As he stepped out from the fireplace, I backed away, terrified of what he might do to me. He took a step forward, his face unreadable, and behind him the fireplace lit up with a loud roar, an inferno swelling within it. Ho, ho, ho! He laughed, coming closer. Your family was not very nice this year, Jordan. I nearly pissed my pants as he said that, thinking he was going to kill me, 
to finish the job, to remove my fucked up family from the gene pool permanently. But instead he surprised me by saying, you were the one person not on my naughty list. Your cousin Chester was so jealous, he was ready to kill his own sister for a knife set. Your uncle Dave, so drunk and cruel, he killed his own sibling out of anger over money. And your brother Noel, so greedy he wouldn't even buy a present for the gift exchange. I stuttered, trying to come up with a response. So it was you? You planned all of this? Orchestrated the whole thing just to get them to take each other out? He laughed merrily again. Ho ho ho! No! I would never do that! I merely sent my elves here to spy and to see it all go down. And to save your life should it come to that. You should thank them, really. Your brother was about to shoot you in the face, just so he could have that fancy knife you're holding. Did you really think he was going to split everything with you? I dropped the knife to the ground, then fell to my knees. Fuck! They're all dead! I said, through tears. They were a bunch of dicks, yeah. But they were my family. Who the hell am I going to spend Christmas with now? A red-gloved hand reached down and rubbed my shoulder, while another wiped the tears from my eyes. I'll take care of that, he said. And the fire began to spread outwards from the fireplace, spreading into the den and setting everything alight. For some reason, the fire didn't burn me. I'll take care of everything, Santa said with a warm smile, helping me to my feet. And so, the next morning, on Christmas Day, I found myself alone, decorating my own tree. Except I wasn't totally alone. That was my gift from Santa. I hung up each decoration carefully, not wanting to break them. After all, I would not be able to replace these fragile glass orbs if they got smashed. I would need to care for them, to keep them safe. My Aunt Debbie pounded on the orb's glass, looking terrified in her ugly Christmas sweater. I could hear her tiny voice from inside, screaming at me to let her out. My brother Noel looked more resigned to his fate as he sat inside the glass globe, watching me. I thought I could see remorse in that look on his face, but it might have just been my imagination. So, what present should I open first? I asked my family in their Christmas ornament prisons. There's a lot of them. Santa said I was really good this year. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.